Let's pray. Heavenly Father, teach us to open our eyes and listen. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. I was thinking about that verse from Genesis 1 on Monday when the rest of my family, literally all of them, were in Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri in total darkness while the moon eclipsed the sun. It brought to mind a quote about shepherds from a favorite author of mine. These shepherds had gone to see the baby Jesus, and one of the shepherds, well, the dialogue, he said, by almighty God, brothers, open your eyes, listen. Open your eyes and listen. Some of you notice when I am preaching or teaching, I close my eyes. It's how I sort through the thousands of pictures and words that are flooding my mind so that I can find the one that I need and then open my eyes and find you and share it. When I close my eyes, I can see my thoughts much clearer. But of course, I can no longer see anything else around me, which I suppose is okay as long as I'm not standing on the edge of a cliff. If I hear a noise and I need to find the noise because it's important, I close my eyes so I can attenuate where the noise is not, and then I open my eyes and I listen so I can track down the source. When we close our eyes, when we are standing in a field while the moon eclipses the sun, when we turn off the lights at night, nothing actually around us changes. We may not be able to see anything, but none of it has actually disappeared. And if we want to prove this, all we have to do is walk forward in just about any direction for a few steps, and we will find something that magically appears, and we stumble over it. I mean, it was there all along. Us not seeing it didn't change the reality of it. So what exactly is faith? Now, most Christians would agree and state that they are saved by faith. Lutherans and Baptists would quickly add, and not by works. And then there would be others that would quote the book of James. But faith without works is dead, and the race is on. Far too many Christians, uh, they've boiled faith down to, well, if you believe the right things about God, then you are saved. But if you believe the wrong things about God, then you are condemned. I need to point out that this turns belief into a work. So even if you are saved by faith, it is your good work of faith that actually saves you, meaning you really aren't saved by faith alone. Now to this, I, I thought I'd add the challenge of all my friends and family members who, due to no fault of their own, simply do not have the mental or emotional capacity to believe everything that most people say that you have to believe. And then you add to that the billions of people over the past 2,000 years who had no chance to hear the gospel. And I think you get a glimpse of why this is so problematic. Now, let's be upfront. Universalism, uh, the belief that everyone is saved regardless of whatever, is neither biblical nor realistic. Faith, the saving kind, is also more than a ticket to heaven that once punched guarantees admittance regardless of what happens after it's punched. And faith is more than just agreeing with one pastor or one church or one denomination without thinking or reading the Bible for yourself. Faith is a standing still in the darkness until you simply can't stand there anymore. You know you're going to bump into things, fall over things, even run into a wall, but you must move because you must find your way out of wherever you are. Whether it is puberty or your first child, or retirement, or college, or marriage, or divorce, or the death of someone special. The darkness descends. The darkness consumes everything around you, and you are left standing there trying not to move because you cannot see anything. Fear, doubt, anxiety are overwhelming. And then you realize the darkness isn't really real. It's dark because you closed your eyes. You shut them so tight that it was the scrunching of your eyes and the pain from it that forced you to realize what was happening. And as you opened your eyes, you could see again. Fear and doubt were still present because even though everything looked the way it did before you closed your eyes, because of what happened, you know it's actually different. It's different because you're growing up or, or figuring out how to love another person or, or live with another person or deal with the pain or find your purpose. Before you closed your eyes, before whatever change changed, you knew, or at least thought you knew, what everything was like. 
But now you aren't so sure. You see, you also know you can't scrunch your eyes anymore. You, you can't stand her any longer. You need to move. And the only question is which direction and where to. This is where faith comes in. Faith that someone created us. We aren't accidents of nature. Faith that there is a purpose and reason for everything that exists and happens, even if we don't always like it or understand it. Faith that there may be a hundred places we could go, a thousand things we could do, but some really are better than others. And perhaps the greatest faith is that someday we will go home, and it will all, and I mean all of it, will have been worth it. So way back in the 1200s, Thomas Aquinas published the five proofs for God. Not so long ago, in 2017, Edward Fesser, a professor, by the way, who specializes in the works of Thomas Aquinas, updated the book. Now, Fesser noted the five proofs of God can be categorized as Aristotelian, Neoplatonic, Augustinian, Thomistic, and Rationalist. Those are all really big words which can be simplified. See, here's the first proof. Motion just doesn't happen. There has to be something that sets everything in motion. Second, nothing can cause itself. Third, nothing can come from nothing, so there must have been something that everything came from. Fourth, there are different degrees of goodness, thus there must be one thing that is actually the definition of goodness. And finally, the order of the universe cannot be the result of chance. Something designed it and gave it purpose. And according to Thomas Aquinas, God is all of those somethings and someones. Now, the reason Aquinas wrote the five proofs is so that people would have a belief, a reason to believe. To Aquinas, faith can't just happen. It has to be revealed. You don't just suddenly know something, especially when it comes to God. But you can be led to a truth or have that truth revealed to you. And so Aquinas set out to help those who were stumbling around in the dark find something to stumble over, namely God. And they would open their eyes, listen for his voice, and find him. You know, the church is really, really good at creating evangelism programs for people who already know about God. We are really, really bad, though, at, at finding a way to reach those who don't know anything about God. We assume everyone thinks and sees things the same way we do, which is why we are surprised when after our latest evangelism program, which, oh, we just thought was absolutely amazing, Nobody's knocking at the church door saying, why didn't we see this before? The five proofs for God cannot prove to the not church, to the not believers, that God exists. Rarely does the world respond to logic, especially, by the way, when it comes to spiritual matters. The five proofs make perfect sense to those who believe. But for those who don't, well, yeah, you see the problem. This does not mean we should throw them out. I mean, they are useful in conversations as we talk to those whose eyes are closed or who live in a world of darkness or whose eyes are barely open and they're living in a vagueness. But we dare not think just by listing the five proofs that the world will suddenly come running and say, we believe. See, I can climb up on the roof of the school and drop a golf ball and show you that gravity works. I can take you up in a balloon and, and show you the curvature of the earth. I can try to have you outrun sound or light to prove that they're faster. But if we were at an old-fashioned doctor, you know the kind that takes that little rubber mallet and taps your knee to find out your reflexes? I could never prove that it was a true knee-jerk reaction and not me kicking my leg. See, the doctor tapping your knee with the rubber mallet leads us back to faith and why all of our scientific and logical explanations don't always work. See, since I can't prove God exists, and they can't prove that he doesn't exist, we're left in limbo. It comes down to faith, which seems like a case of circular logic, or which came first, the chicken or the egg. See, when St. James says a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone, he's not contradicting the rest of the Bible. In fact, he's lining up perfectly with all of the other authors. I mean, Jesus is the one who said, if you continue in my word then you are truly my disciples. And in John 14, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Works are a necessary response to faith and love. 
Now, the Bible does not say exactly how much a person needs to know and believe about God in order to be saved, nor, nor does it specify exactly what you must believe except that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. We, we find that in Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, but there is no sliding scale. No A plus, B minus, D plus, or F minus. It, just believe, the Bible says. This is because salvation is not about getting out of hell and into heaven. Salvation is more than just about what happens when we die. Those are important questions. It's also a lot more than helping us handle grief or tough it out through a sickness or repair a relationship or become a better dad. See, at each individual moment in our lives, one of these may be a higher priority than the others. But we have to see salvation as something more than a get out of hell free card and pass and go and collecting $200. This is where I pull out the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. Now, if you remember Goldilocks, she rummaged through, rummaged through the bears' homes and she found three of everything. One that was too hard, one that was too soft, and one that was just right. The church often takes all that we know and all that we are and, and we make it either too hard or too soft rather than trying to find that which is just right. Jesus was working with his disciples on learning to forgive everyone. That includes their enemies and even those who sin against them multiple times in the same day. And a moment comes where they realize they just do not have the ability to do what Jesus is asking. And so in exasperation, they cry out, increase our faith. And Jesus starts talking about throwing mulberry trees into the ocean and having them take root, which sounds like a really random answer, unless out of frustration he was actually using the word mulberry tree, but he meant disciples, and he was going to throw, throw them into the ocean. But nevertheless, he, he says that they would take root and grow fruit, so good would happen. Jesus then gets even more extreme, because in the next verse he says, if you are following the law, if you're doing everything that the law requires, you are not going to get any thanks or compliments from God because it is what you are supposed to do. I mean, did you hear that? If we follow the law, if we work really, really, really hard at doing all those thou shalts and, and not doing the thou shalt nots and actually get a lot of it done, God isn't going to pat us on the back. He's not going to tell us how great we are because those are the things we are supposed to, supposed to do. Those are the bare minimum requirements for being human which is why most of us feel like we're trying to make it through the, just trying to make it through the day. Our lives are work and play, highs and lows, all the stuff that makes up an ordinary life. But when the darkness comes, when the pain comes, we always feel like we need more faith. So what is expected of our faith? The disciples were worried because Jesus was talking about forgiveness and giving money to the poor and taking up crosses and following him. All things, by the way, that, that would not be categorized within the ordinary life. See, it's no wonder the disciples were asking for an extra sprinkle of fairy dust. If they barely had enough faith to get through the ordinary, how could they follow Jesus into the extraordinary? So we back up, open our eyes, and listen. We listen, and if we listen, we hear what Jesus was saying. He says, you have enough faith. All it takes is something smaller than a mustard seed, and you have that. You see, faith is not a measurable thing. I know we say, oh, ye of little faith, and increase our faith, and you got to have faith. But I don't think any of us believe that we have a faith tank that we have to fill up. I mean, it would be so much easier if we had a faith gauge, and we knew that we were at three quarters of a tank, or a quarter of a tank, or the E was flashing. See, the actual problem is when we think we can measure faith that way, because it leads to unnecessary doubt. This is where our Lutheran heritage can shine in if we let it. We have a confessing faith. That's one of the standards of Lutheranism, a confessing faith. We confess our faith through our life, through our words, through our sins, our doubts, our failures. A confessing faith says that we are not perfect. We aren't even close to perfect, that we need Jesus. And we are going to mess up right up until the day the moment, the minute, the second, the moment that we die. And God has promised to love and heal and forgive us anyway. When Jesus said, if you confess me before the world, he, he didn't mean running around screaming, Jesus is Lord, or, or putting he is greater than I bumper stickers on everything. There's nothing wrong with those things, but that's not faith. 
Faith is trying and failing and asking for forgiveness. Faith is crying because we are empty, and when we fall on our knees, God picks us up. Faith is holding someone's hand and saying, look, I don't have an answer, but I'm here with you, and you're not alone. Reach up and touch your forehead. I know the water has long since dried from your baptism, although I sweat so much that it's often like I am being eternally baptized. But I want you to remember this. When the water was poured and the word spoken, God said that he would be with you to the ends of the earth, to the ends of time. He said that you would never, ever be alone. Those words are very clearly recorded in the scriptures. And it doesn't matter if you can't feel him, see him, or touch him. He's there. It doesn't matter how dark it is. Open your eyes and listen. And if you aren't ready to open your eyes and let the light in, stumble around until you fall over Jesus and then let him hold on to you. Faith rests on the promises of God, not our feelings or our works or our reasoning. And when God says, my word does not return to me empty, but it accomplishes the task for which I sent it, he's talking about working in and through us. You see, we have enough faith because God won't set us up for failure. We are the works of God. The way we prove it is simply living with an imperfect faith that always leads us back to Him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.